Hi, everybody. It's a good crowd tonight. You guys like Untraceable? Good event? I think I'm the man who stands between you and alcohol, so be brief and be precise. So I love this event. I've come several times. COVID got in the way of a few of them, but this is actually where I was interviewed by Larry King. And that was a really pivotal moment for me because I remember growing up and he interviewed 10 U.S. presidents. How about that? Throughout his life. And he came here and this was one of the last events he attended before he died. Isn't that cool? Toronto has this incredible legacy in the cryptocurrency space. It is the birthplace of Ethereum. Anybody from there? You people. And also, it was really the place where the party got started because this is the beginning of the smart contract revolution. We kind of invented some cool technology and then we had to figure out what the heck do we want to do with that cool technology. And if we take a step back, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology is actually in a broader class of technologies called exponential technologies. Anybody see the Oppenheimer movie? Show of hands. All right. Anybody see the Barbie movie? Yeah, all right. Anybody do the Barbie Heimer, where you did Oppenheimer and Barbie together? Yeah, we got a few people. That's brilliant marketing, right? Yeah. Well, why do we talk about that? Nuclear weapons are an example. You put a little bit in and you get a lot out. You put a little bit more in, you get a lot out. First nuclear weapon, Trinity, New Mexico, is 25 kilotons. Ten years later, we had the one at Bikini Atolls. 15 megatons, 25,000 to 15 million. It's pretty remarkable. The problem is humans are really bad at understanding the consequences and nature of exponential technologies and what they mean. So here's a great example, prime the pump a bit. So let's say you have a chessboard. How many squares does it have? It's eight by eight, it's 64 squares. So let's say we can make you a deal. I can either fill this entire building with grains of wheat, or I can put one grain of wheat on the first square, two on the next, four on the next, and so forth. Add them up together. Which one would you take? You know, you think, oh, this is a trick question, so I'll pick the chessboard. But, you know, if you were just thinking about it, most people would say, there's a ton of wheat here. Well, it turns out that if you do the math, it's 18 quintillion grains of wheat, which is 2,000 times the global production of wheat for that one thing. That's how powerful exponential growth happens to be. And the thing is that blockchain technology is the first structure that is a social exponential technology. A small group of people here in Toronto met a small group of people in America and in Europe. They came together and they created a movement that now has over 20 million people. Ethereum, worth, yeah, well more than 100 billion, massive amounts of prominence. Every person in the world, whether you go to Mongolia or Chile or anywhere else, knows the name. And more importantly, they know about cryptocurrencies and the concepts. Because while Ethereum introduced the concepts, smart contracts are ubiquitous now. NFTs are ubiquitous now. All of these things that were pioneered there are fire that has been given to everybody else. And therein lies the lesson of exponential technology. He who discovers it is not the person who controls it. They're just the person who lights the fire. And the problem is when we look to the 21st century, we don't have just one exponential technology like the 20th century did. Nuclear weapons was the one in the 20th century. The whole human race was almost eradicated twice. And it was because of a single person in each case that we didn't all die. Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And then there was a lieutenant colonel who ran a nuclear silo in Moscow in the 1980s who had a software bug and he was ordered to launch nuclear weapons. In both cases, it was a single person who decided not to do it against orders and they were punished afterwards. Now, the 21st century, we don't have just one exponential technology, we have five. AI, quantum computing, nanotechnology, synthetic biology and blockchain. Think about that, five. And the problem is that these technologies, we tend to regulate them through scarcity. Only nine nations officially have nuclear weapons. Maybe there's a few floating around here and there, but it's a small club. Every person in this room has blockchain. And if you see ChatGPT, Claude, you see 
what's going on with Bard, soon to be Gemini. And you have capabilities growing a 10x, a 100x, a 1,000x in a very short time period. And those are being built initially by large companies. In just a few years, they'll be handed down to mid-size, eventually small companies. What does that mean? That the exponential technologies of the world are becoming democratized. This is going to be the character of the 21st century, the wisdom we apply, for better or for worse, of what to do about that. There's never been a time in human history where so few could lift the world, like an Archimedean lever. A small group of people here could change the lives of every person in Africa. A small group of people in Africa can change the lives of every person here. It doesn't matter the systems you were born into, it doesn't matter the economy you come from, the educational background that you have. I mean, if you were a minister of education and the president comes to you and says, tell me, what should the curriculum be so the grade school students today are competitive in 2030 or 2040? Would you even have an idea what to put in there? We'll teach them about chemistry and biology and all these things. Well, what the hell does that mean when you can just go to ChatGPT and ask a question, and in 10 years, it gives you an answer better than the smartest person you've ever met in your life? Is that a skill that's going to be competitive, get you a job? Is that a skill that's going to get you ahead in life? You look at blockchain technology, Web3, what are we doing? We say we unlock the potential of all the people in the world. Well, yes, we are. If a small group of people here in this room invent a voting system that's massively better than the voting systems of nation states, every nation state in the world gets to use that for free tomorrow. Every corporation gets to use that. Every club gets to use that for free. Think of that. Think about how powerful that concept is. We talk about property rights. We talk about financial systems. If you align the incentives right, they spread like wildfire and you wake up and suddenly every single person has something exponentially better than the generation before. So the problem we should be talking about, the thing we have to solve as we tackle these technologies like SynBio, like AI, like nanotech and blockchain, is how do you regulate them? How do you talk about them in a way? And my conjecture is that the only way to regulate them responsibly is the use of blockchain technology. Because in solving the governance of blockchain, you solve the governance of any social system or any technology. Otherwise, the only other option is either to ban the technology or to install a world government that's capable and so strong and pervasive that it can prevent each and every person from using it. Think about AI. Not too long ago, all these people got together and they signed this letter and they said, we need to slow down a little bit. We have to take a 100-day pause. You know, we just need to catch our bearings and, and we're going to create a website, safe.ai, and we're, we're going we're to figure out how to solve the alignment problem. And then here's what happened. Microsoft integrated OpenAI into Office, Copilot comes out. And then Google says, God, that's a big problem. So one of the founders of Google comes out of retirement. Got a hundred billion dollars, he's living on yachts. Life is good for Sergey Brin. And he walks in, he's like, you know, I'm just gonna take over the whole AI thing. I don't report to anybody, because I kind of still own a large chunk of the company. So the whole AI team is just my team now. Deep mind, you're mine, you guys over there, you're mine. So we're gonna train Gemini, and it's gonna be a hundred times more powerful next year than GPT-4. And what are we gonna train it on? You guys ever use YouTube? Google Docs, Gmail, Search? A few of you, right? Well, what if all that data is fair game? And what if you could do the reinforcement learning instead of using human feedback with automated feedback? So you use the models to train the models. The single most expensive part of it is now free. So what does it mean? Microsoft says, oh shit, we can't slow down. Fuck, we gotta speed up. We gotta get that GPT-5 out there. And then Thropic says, oh God, you know, Claude is gonna look terrible. We gotta get Claude 3 out. And Facebook says, well, Llama, Llama's gotta get out there, right? Yeah, we've got to get Llama 3. We love Llama. Okay. What does that mean? A competitive equilibrium is misaligned with us, our intent. If the intent of the people is to slow down, why did they create a competitive reality where the only answer is to speed up? And guess which field is the world leader 
in incentives engineering, thinking about these puzzles, getting people to do things without passing a law. The blockchain industry, we're the best in the world at incentives engineering. You hear about tokenomics, you hear about game theory, all these people try to figure out, how do I get somebody to mine my cryptocurrency? How do I get somebody to build on my platform? How do I incentivize people to do these things? That's what we do, because we don't have the power of the state. Yet somehow, someway, lacking legal agency, regulation, a corporate structure, a centralized leader, unlike all these other people, in 13 years, we went from a single dude mining something on a single computer to a global movement with hundreds of millions of people building giant mining factories. I live in Gillette, Wheatland, and many other places. I've got a clinic up in Gillette. Right next to where my construction warehouse is at, I see this odd structure. I said, what the hell is that? I get a little closer, I say, no way. This is a 35,000 population town. That's a Bitcoin mining pool. In Gillette, Wyoming, the middle of damn nowhere, do you think there was a Bitcoin Bureau of Mining that decided, you know, we just can't wait to construct something in Gillette? No. We can't even figure out who the hell the guy is. I'm a little pissed off. He's in my backyard. He didn't come talk to me. I'm, I'm the crypto guy there. So that is the superpower. You didn't have to ask permission. You design the incentives in the right way, and people just do things. So alignment is an incentive problem at its core. The question then is, how do you decide alignment? And therein lies the wisdom of these systems. If you talk to the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project in the 40s, the majority of them first thought the bomb was going to be dropped on Nazi Germany. It was a little personal for a lot of them. Then when Germany lost the war, they said, oh, we'll never have to use it then. And they said, no, 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 we're going to use it on Japan. So they asked for a recommendation, and they said, the best thing to do would be drop it nearby Tokyo. Try to find a place that's not very populated, but make sure they can see it. Because if they can, they'll know the horror of it, and they won't want anybody to use it. You know what the military did? Truman stepped in and he said, you know, I got this Potsdam conference, and the Russians, they have a massive army in Eastern Europe, and if they don't understand the power of this weapon we have, we won't be able to negotiate the borders of Europe the way we'd like. So, let's drop it a few times on Japan. How do you think those scientists felt? They spent years of their life building something, thinking that it is the ultimate weapon of peace. And not only did that happen, but a tribe of them, a group of them, just said, we can build a bigger one, a fusion bomb, a thousand times more powerful. This is a lack of wisdom in a system. Every time you get great power, you have to have great responsibility. And the issue with the human race is, A, we're terrible at exponential thinking. If you give any normal person that wheat experiment with the chessboard, a lot of them would pick the big pile of wheat in the silo, because it's hard to conceive growth of that nature. It's a cognitive limitation of people. And most people are not allowed to think big. You're not told that when you're a kid. You know, everybody says, don't worry, you can be a Navy SEAL astronaut fighter pilot president. But then they say, well, you know, maybe you can be a teacher. Maybe you can work really hard, be a doctor. But how many people legitimately think they're going to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a president or a Nobel laureate? Some people do. Most of us can't get there. It's a small club. The problem is that with exponential technologies that are democratized, each and every one of you has to have the wisdom, strategic foresight, and capabilities of those types of roles. Because at the end of the day, your use of the technology, your consumer preferences, how you view these things, will ultimately determine whether we succeed or fail. COVID is a phenomenal example of that. Some people say it was natural, some people say it was made in a lab, the one thing that's undeniable is it started with a single person. Somebody got infected somewhere. And just a few months later, the entire world was shut down. And every single one of our lives, every single one of our societies, in some way was impacted. A million Americans died. Many Canadians died. A lot of you had to deal with the lockdowns. It was horrible. It felt bad. And that's an example of the power of exponential technology. What's horrifying is 
Whichever side of the debate you fall on, synthetic biology, a small group of people can make that happen anywhere in the world. And wherever it happens, it impacts all of us. So this is, in my view, our industry, the single most important contribution it's going to make to society isn't that we're going to get more efficient financial systems or beautiful voting systems or NFTs or a new way of viewing intellectual property. That's great. We're going to get those things. That's evolution and innovation, better, faster, cheaper. And there's plenty of people in this room fighting like hell to get those things because they like money, they like changing things, they like helping people. Everybody's got a mission, everybody's got an itch. But the single most important contribution of the industry is going to be in governing blockchain technology in a way that it works for us. You learn how to govern exponential technology. You learn how to distribute wisdom. I'll give an example. So Cardano is my pet project. I've been working on it for a little while. Do you guys like Cardano? There's a few people. Crypto media, are you listening? Cameras back there? Okay. Pulling a Trump there. Very dishonest. Um, so Cardano is my pet project. I've been working on it for a long time. And it's not just me, it's millions of people. And everywhere I go, I see people doing interesting things, having interesting conversations. So right now, we are having the most interesting, deep, and intricate conversation a cryptocurrency can have. What shall be the government of the cryptocurrency? Is it completely off-chain, and we just hope to God somehow it works, and then at some point we can evolve? That's what Bitcoin does, and it doesn't evolve very quickly. Is it completely on-chain and everything is there and we just have to hope to God we've built a perfect government or is it some sort of hybrid of the two? So we created a system called SIP 1694 together. The initial idea was started in December. We named it after Voltaire's birthday because that's the Voltaire era of Cardano. And what we learned from this is including people was a good idea. A small group of people talked about it. And then we ended up having more than 50 workshops across the world, and I think more than 30 countries. And then the people who attended those converged on Scotland, and came up with the final form of it. But the single most interesting part of this is kind of this idea of a constitution for a decentralized system. What are the universal rules that are hard to change? What are the universal things that give you things that you would like to be explicit? Like how many people here hold Bitcoin? Probably a lot of people. What if tomorrow somebody said, you know what's a good idea for adoption purposes? We're going to print four million more Bitcoin. Would you be like super happy about that? No, because you kind of signed up for it never going to happen ever because that's not who we are and that's not Bitcoin and go to hell and I'm going to throw acid on your face. It's true though. So, that's a constitutional thing. That's a sacred right, like freedom of speech and religion, these types of things. We'd like it to be permanent. So you probably should write stuff like that down. Okay, so how do you get a great constitution? Well, here's how we're gonna do it with Cardano. And I'm getting to the point about wisdom. So, a small group of people will start the initial push, then a larger and a larger group, and then hold workshops in more than 100 countries. Every single one of those countries will elect a delegate, will have a constitutional convention, do it in Argentina, because South America needs some love too. And then that committee, that convention will ratify, and then it'll be ratified by the community. Now this is cool because it's super inclusive and you get to have a beautiful picture with lots of flags, but more importantly, every person participating, those are normal people. They're not constitutional scholars. They're not people who spent 45 years and teach constitutional law at Harvard. They're passionate community members that have taken it upon themselves to build a government of a decentralized system that has a larger population than the country of Georgia. Some of these people come from countries that have never known democracy. Some of these countries have no notion of human rights, no notion of the things that inspired the United States when we wrote our constitution, the Lockean notion of the benefit beneficiary, the trust, the public trust. Well, in the process of participating, each and every one of them learns about democracy. 
Each and every one of them learns about the pitfalls of making collective decisions, where we went wrong, where we go right. They take that home with them as a gift to give to others. That changes the world. So if your system starts doing important things like nation state voting, everybody who participates in that takes that home and they start asking basic questions like, why don't I have an election system where I can check my own vote? How many people would like to do that? Basic concept, right? I can vote on my phone. Yeah, that sounds good. I can check and make sure it was recorded. I can check and make sure it was recorded the way I voted. Isn't this a democracy? Wouldn't it be nice to have it? They say, you can't have it. Why? The secrecy of the ballot. What about mail-in ballots? Like, oh, well, that doesn't count. You see, you give them a better voting system, they say, why can't I use this voting system? The thing I use to vote on my NFT project is apparently a better voting system than my damn country has. How about that? So what do you do? You vote for that. And then suddenly you wake up and you have a much more fair system, but then you start asking questions. You start saying things like, why is it in America, two-party system? Why can't I have five parties? Why can't we do preference voting? So I pick my first choice and second choice and then third choice instead of just voting for one. <gasps> then suddenly we have diversity of thought. Suddenly people have to compromise and coalitions have to form. My Lord, think of that. How would much would that change the world? How much would that change the society around you? Because the young people will demand it. Why? Because that's what they're used to, because when they have their NFT or their cryptocurrency, they've already gotten used to voting. They've already gotten used to this idea that they have rights. They've gotten used to being their own bank. They've gotten used to having financial privacy. They've gotten used to kind of being in charge of their life instead of having someone else be in charge of their life. But yet somehow we have to make this work not just for a small group of people, but for everybody. And that is the key for alignment with exponential technologies. You have to find a way to have these superpowers that can lift the world and give them to people in a way where they know what to do with them. They have the wisdom for what to do with them. The 21st century is going to be the most exciting in the history of humanity. It's the make or break century. You hear about the Fermi paradox and these things, like most things don't seem to survive past a certain point. This is the moment. You are now in control. The whole world is being rewritten and reprogrammed. All the conventions that we grew up with, all the statements about you can never be the president or the Navy SEAL or the astronaut, that's gone. It doesn't matter anymore. It's changed. You've been given fire and you have to decide what you're going to do with that fire. And if we do a good job here, then I think we can do a good job everywhere else, and it's gonna be one hell of a century. Thank you, everybody.